before we address that, I want to give also another reminder. If, if you don't have lunch plans, even if you do have lunch plans, please change them and join us. We're having lunch in the back after service, and um, it's just a great time of fellowship. We've got plenty of food. If you didn't bring anything, don't worry about it. We just want to spend time with you. Um, so please plan on joining us for lunch. Now, this isn't the typical way we start, but I'm not sure how many people know that a couple months ago, our family lost our beloved dog, Brownie. She was a sweet dog. <laughs> not the brightest bulb on the strand, but she was very loyal and loving. She was a great dog, and we miss her a lot. We've since added another pet to her family. His name is Rex. There's Rex. <laughs> Already we're seeing some special things about Rex. He's also sweet, but at 16 weeks old, he's already smarter than Brownie was. I've found that smart dogs are great only when you can break their will. Never their spirit. You never want to break their spirit, but you must break their will. One of the best dogs I ever had, his name was Oscar. He was a boxer. He was very athletic and smart, full of energy and life. I was super excited to, to have him because I wanted to take him running and hiking. But as he got big enough to start participating in these activities, I quickly learned that because he was so smart, he had his own idea of what he wanted to do, other than joining me in what I wanted for him. There was one pivotal moment when everything came to a head with Oscar. At this moment, Oscar's will was broken, and he finally submitted his will to mine. From that day forward, I never had issues with Oscar again. I brought him everywhere, and we went on many adventures. Because he was so smart and he had surrendered his will, we were now able to have so much fun together. He trusted me. And I was able to teach him all kinds of cool tricks. One of my favorite involved doggy treats. I would have him sit and tell him to hold it. Then, depending on how he would, had placed his head when I told him to hold, hold it, I would put dog treats either on top of his nose, sometimes on top of his mouth, on top of his head. I would throw him all around, I would set him on his paws, and he wouldn't move a muscle. Not until I said the magic words, that'll do. Oscar and I had a special bond. He trusted me and knew that when the time was right, I would give him not just the treats, but everything he loved. Toys, attention, exercise, and affection. He was willing to forego temporal reward and obey. He counted on me. He trusted me to provide everything he needed and desired and was willing for, to wait for me to designate the proper time and the proper way. When I would set up Oscar and tell him to hold it, no matter how he was tempted, as long as his mind was focused on me, he would wait. As we go through this passage today, I hope that we'll all become a little more like Oscar, surrendering our will and offering our spirit to the perfect giver and sustainer of life. Our primary text this morning will be James chapter 1. If you would go ahead and open your Bibles with me. We'll read verses 13 to 18 together. I'll read aloud, you can follow along. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. But he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Death, or do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. 
of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Before we unpack this text, let's ask God for his help. Father God, you know how deeply this text has challenged my will and pride, knowing that all of us here today suffer at some level from the sin of pride, choosing our own will over yours again and again. Please help us to humble ourselves and submit our wills to yours. Help us not only to understand your word, but to repent from our sins and live in agreement with your plan for our life. Help us to learn this morning how to respond properly to temptation and to recognize the truth of your character and the truth of your word. Make us holy people. Set us apart to do your work in this dark and fallen world. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at the topic of temptation this morning, we'll be covering three points. The first is the source of temptation. The second is the inevitable process of temptation. And the final point will be the heart of temptation, unmasking the deception. Along the way, we will also find four steps of action to take to become victorious over temptation. So let's jump right in and consider the source of temptation. To start this passage helps us not to deal with the peripheral symptoms of sin in our lives, but to understand the root cause of temptation so we can gain victory over it, thereby removing sin at its root. This passage begins by eliminating God as the source of temptation. Look back at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So James is so blunt and clear. We're told God cannot be tempted and he tempts no one. When talking about temptation, this is a great place to start the conversation. What has been the go-to response from the beginning when people have fallen into temptation? Does anyone re remember what happened in Genesis chapter 3? That's the record of how Adam and Eve were tempted and sin entered the world. After they had eaten the fruit, does anybody remember what Eve's response was? <laughs> she blamed the serpent, right? How about Adam? Was his response any better? No. In fact, it was more blunt. I'll read it for you. This is Genesis 3.12. The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Notice, neither of them took responsibility, and both ultimately blamed God. When Eve blamed the serpent, the question is, who put the serpent in the garden? God did, right? So who's she blaming? She's blaming God. Who did Adam blame? blame. Basically, I'll, I'll do the Josh paraphr paraphrase right here. Basically, he said, you were the one who put her here, not my choice, not my fault. It's yours. You see, if we try to excuse, excuse me, <laughs> if we try to excuse our sin by blaming anyone or anything other than ourselves, we're blaming God. And honestly, we're no better than they were. We've just become a little more sophisticated about it. Think about this with me. Our society today has invented all kinds of ways for guilty people who are suffering from the consequence of their bad behavior to look for a reason for their sin and its consequences outside of themselves. It's become acceptable for everyone to shift the blame to their parents, their partners, or other people in general. We also blame our genetics, our nature. Science tells us that our DNA is to blame for our sins. For example, if we have a ge genetic predisposition to alcoholism, then drinking our life into oblivion is no longer a sin because it's not our fault. It's God's fault. You see, any of these arguments that we are somehow not responsible ultimately end up blaming our sinful behavior on God. 
If we do anything other than take full responsibility for falling into temptation, we're saying that God is responsible for them to, for the temptation. He is the reason why I chose to sin. Let me say this clearly here this morning with James. God is not the source of temptation. And to say he is is an attack on his character, on his holiness. God hates sin in all its forms. And he will in no way be involved with leading people into sin. Does God allow sin? Clearly, yes. Does God use the consequences of sin in our life? Absolutely, yes, he does. But this is entirely different than causing sin or setting people up to sin. The first 12 verses of James teach us that God tests us. But his intentions in te testing us are for our good and to strengthen us. These verses affirm what we're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. So tests come from God, but temptations never do. Here's the difference between testing and tempting. God tests us to bring out the good. Satan and his tools tempt us to bring out the bad. A clear example of this is seen in Job. Satan's attacks on Job were designed to tempt him to curse God. At the same time, in the same event, God was not tempting Job, but testing his beloved servant and refining him. Verse 13 says, God cannot be tempted with evil. This is a statement with huge theological implications. The Bible teaches us about who God is. One of the basic tenets of our faith is that there is only one God and that he's triune. We call this the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So if God the Father can't be tempted with evil, then Jesus nor the Holy Spirit can be tempted either. Does this raise any questions for anyone? Wasn't Jesus tempted by the devil in the wilderness? Doesn't Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 say, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted? Yes, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. And yes, Hebrews does reference Jesus being tempted. But Hebrews 4.15 offers more. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews says, <laughs> Jesus was tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sin. James says, God cannot be tempted with evil. Is this a contradiction? How do these two statements align? I'm going to leave this hanging for a little bit. The text paints a picture that helps us to understand this much better in just a little bit. And I don't want to spoil that before we get there. But if you're taking notes, write this down. Is this a contradiction? And we'll come back to it. So why does James say God can't be tempted by evil? He can't be tempted because it violates his character. God finds sin utterly repulsive in all its forms, and his whole being burns against it. Think of it this way. What does a magnet attract? Can it attract any of the precious metals? Platinum, gold, silver? No. A magnet only draws iron. Now, I'm not a big science guy, so I don't have complete understanding here. But the most simplified explanation I've heard is that a mag magnet can draw iron only because they share the same nature. So it is with God. Think of God as the purest, most precious metal. For the sake of our argument, we'll, we'll say platinum. God, or, yeah, so evil can't draw God, just like a magnet cannot draw platinum. God can't be tempted by evil because they have nothing in common. The opposite is true of our flesh. We, unless we have been redeemed by God, are attracted to evil. We're drawn to it because we have, the, that, because we have that same part of our nature that's drawn to sin, just as iron to a magnet 
we are naturally drawn to sin. And just as platinum is not drawn to a magnet, no temptation, no evil has any draw on God. So God cannot be tempted by evil. Verse 13 goes on to say, not only can God not be tempted, but he himself tempts no one. God is repulsed by sin. This is a huge part of the gospel, isn't it? Because God is holy and just, he can't tolerate sin. All sin must be atoned for. It must be paid for. What does Romans 6.23 say? For the wages of sin is death. God has no part with sin. Not only is he not tempted, but he tempts no one. This then begs the question, if God is not the source of temptation, then what is? Read with me in verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. We're going to take this verse a little out of order, but we'll get to all of it. What's the source of our temptation in this verse? The source of temptation is our desire. That's why I titled this sermon, Temptation, an Inside Job. As we already talked about with the magnets, we are drawn to sin because of our nature. All creatures are tempted. Hunters and fishermen use this all the time. Elk hunters mimic the sound and smells that attract elk. Fishermen all know that if you're not using the right fly or lure, you'll never get a bite. The goal of the temptation is to play on the natural desires and instincts of the prey. We all have desires. And you may, be, you may not be drawn to the same things I am. Our desires are what draw us into temptation. These desires are not all bad. I found it helpful as I was studying this text to learn that the Greek word here for desire, it's a neutral term. It doesn't indicate bad desire. It's just a predisposition to liking something over something else. We are tempted when these desires are drawn out with the intent of evil. Working to provide for you and your family's physical needs, that's good. Working for the goal of selfishly building wealth and power to harm to the harm of everything else, that's bad. Food, not inherently bad, but taken in excess, not good. Sex, within the bounds of bi a biblically defined marriage, good. But outside of that, bad. We often desire good things, but are tempted to pursue them outside of God's will, God's perfect design. So what is the root of temptation? Where does it begin? It begins inside of us with our unbridled desires. Now, let's look at the response of temptation, or the process of temptation. Verse 14 says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. It would be easier to skip over the first part of this verse as it's very obvious, but I want to draw attention to it. Each person, everyone is tempted, believer and unbeliever, rich or poor, healthy or sick, we are all tempted. Temptations will occur again and again for the rest of our lives. So it's vitally important to learn how to respond rightly, how to respond biblically. In the next phrase, James uses a fishing term, lured and enticed. This combination of words is called a hendiades. Not that you need to know that word, but it's just kind of fun to say, hendiades. It's a combination of words that has a separate meaning than the words individually. It's like the phrase, sick and tired. <laughs> we, when we use that phrase, we're not saying that we're sick or that we're tired, we're saying we're sick and tired. We're fed up. We're done with whatever we're dealing with. The phrase lured and enticed is used that way. It's a, it's a package deal. In Greek, this was a common fishing term. When you think of bait fishing, whether it's underwater lures or dry flies, the goal is to draw the fish to the hook. It has to be the right lure at the right time to draw them out especially those big old fish that have seen every kind of bait before. But when you get the right bait and you present it in the right way, the fish can't help but bite. 
in preparation for this sermon, I, I watched some underwater fishing videos, and I'm sure you've seen them. The bait with the hook goes down around the fish. The fish looks over. Sometimes you see just their eyes twitch, right? Sometimes they turn their whole body toward this bait. Sometimes it pulls them out of their hole, and they start coming toward the bait. The fish... Um, they come out of their hiding spot, and if the fisherman does just the right movement with the bait, mimicking the bait in the right way, the fish will attack, swallowing the hook. In the video, sometimes you'll see a fish that gets lured and enticed. It gets drawn out, but it doesn't take the bait. It doesn't take the hook. Something wasn't right, and their desire was not for the bait that they were drawn out for. This is where desire comes into the picture here. When the right bait is dangled before the right fish, it's over. The fish will not be able to control its impulse. The fish's desire has met the opportunity to satisfy that desire. This is the intersection to be avoided, the place where desire and opportunity meet. One without the other can probably handle it. But the two together, you're going to be a dead man. When desire and opportunity coincide, it's the location of disaster. Think about the story of David and Bathsheba. When David is out on the roof, he, he wasn't necessarily out there looking to sin. But, when he saw, but he was harboring a lustful desire. And when he saw the woman bathing, he was what this passage describes as lured and enticed. His desire was given an opportunity and then everything else was set in motion. So once we take the bait, once our will consents to the temptation, it's only a matter of time. When David saw Bathsheba, his desire, his desire would not be appeased until he had her. Going back to the fishing videos, I watched several fish go after the bait. And unknown to the fishermen that was above the water, they actually pulled the bait right out of the fish's mouth. But once the fish was committed to the bait, it didn't matter. They would pursue the bait until it was securely in their mouth and the hook was set. This is how it is with us. Once our will commits to the sin, our will will search out and pursue the opportunity. When desire and opportunity come together, this leads us to the next step in the process. Before we move on to verse 15, this is where I wanted to come back to the question of Jesus' temptation. You see, we have a sinful nature. Jesus did not. Our desire, our desires are what lead us into temptation and ultimately into sin. Jesus' nature was the nature of God, sinless, holy, so Satan did his very best to tempt Jesus with every possible sin. But here's the key difference. Jesus' desire was only for the will of his father. It's like the fish that you can't find the right bait for. There is nothing that Satan or anyone else could have offered Jesus that would have elevated his desire for anything other than the will of his father. So Jesus was externally tempted in every way we are. But his desire was never aroused. His desire was never tempted. So Hebrews is right. Satan threw everything he can, at everything he could at Jesus. And James is right. God cannot be tempted by evil. Now, let's finish out the process. Look back with me at verse 15. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Desire and opportunity lead to sinful action. This action doesn't have to be a physical act. Do you remember when Pastor Eric went through the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus started talking about sin? He made several statements that went like this. You have heard it said, but I say to you. In this section, Jesus equates anger with the act of murder, lust with adultery, 
and several other comparisons addressing issues of our will and desire and how those are every bit as damaging as committing the act. These are equated because this is the heart of the issue. This is, this is actually an issue of our heart. Just like when Adam and Eve committed that first sin, they didn't eat of the fruit of that tree unknowingly. It wasn't an accident. It was a willful act of disobedience. If we commit the sin in our heart, the eternal consequence will be the same. Sin has only one outcome, death. Both physical and spiritual death. And this is what all of us are born into. And we must recognize that there is only one remedy for this. We must place our faith in the person and work of Jesus. Only he has conquered death. No other religion in the world points to an empty tomb. You must repent of your sin. You must place your faith in Christ. Then you will be a new creation. You will have a new heart. And you have access to the only power in all of creation that can reverse this process of temptation sin, and death. Going back just a little bit, for the believer, for the one who has trusted Christ, at the point where desire starts to drift away, before the will is engaged and the sin is committed, this is where we must act. We can't consent to sin at any point. And the longer it lingers in our mind, in our heart, the greater the chance of surrendering completely to the temptation. Some of you may be asking, okay, this is where I am. It's just stuck in my head. It's stuck in my heart. I can't escape it. I ask God for help, but it's still there. How do I act? What do I need to do? If this is where you are, you're in the perfect spot. Because James leads us into action with these next few verses. Look with me at, at verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Pause for a quick highlight here, beloved brothers. James is talking to all his Christian brothers and sisters, his believing family. We already mentioned this, but it's worth saying again, everyone faces temptation. And being a follower of Christ does not automatically make us immune from temptation. This verse also contains an important warning, warning that requires action on our part. This warning should lead us to look out for the lies of this world, to look out for the lies of Satan. We are to be on guard, looking for anything that might make our heart and our desire stray from God's will for us. God's will is revealed again and again throughout the scripture. There are so many places we can turn, but since we're studying 1 Thessalonians with Pastor Eric, here are a couple from there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 to 7. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you before and, ha and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us... To uh, called us for impurity, but in holiness. That's not unclear, is it? God has called us. God has not called us for impurity, but for holiness. Another is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Please don't think I'm saying this is easy. Bad things happen, hard things happen, and this can be difficult. But God will never call you to something he won't equip you for. Giving thanks in all circumstances requires faith in the goodness of God. And when things are hard, and I mean life-altering hard, it can be very difficult to give thanks. But if we know the character of God as revealed in the word of God, we can surrender our will and our lives into his hands, even in the dark, darkest time. God has not hidden his desires from us. 
So we must not be tempted to believe something false or outside of his plan for us. Now let's, ex- let's spend a moment and define, uh, define the lie that James is addressing here. What is the deception? In answering this question, I think it's good that we take our mind back to the fall of Adam and Eve that we talked about earlier. What was the first lie ever told and who told it? I would assume everyone here knows that Satan told the first lie. He's described in John chapter 8, verse 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. What was the lie that Satan told? At its heart, the lie was that you can find good apart from God and his will for you. Alistair Begg commented on our passage this way. You see, Satan, who is a flat-out liar, who is a deceiver, who is a murderer, who is the father of all lies, who is a con man extraordinaire, who is the one who will tell you 99 true things so that the hundredth thing that he tells you, which is false, you may swallow because he's told you so many true things before he tells you the lie. Beg continues, Satan wants us to believe that there's a whole selection of wonderful treats and experiences, and God doesn't want us to have them. That's what he wants us to believe, that somehow or another, God is keeping the good stuff from us. That if we were to go down Satan's road and down Satan's avenue, then we would discover all the things that we're missing out on, on account of God's law and God's will and God's purposes. I'm sorry that when I say that, I don't have that same Scottish accent. That makes everything better. Um, Anyway, the lie that begat all lies was that God is somehow withholding something good from you. And his commands are not to help you, but to harm you. And conceal from you the best things God has to offer. The antidote to that lie, to all lies is another action we can take, and that's to state the truth. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In the Greek, the emphasis is on, the, is on good and perfect, that which is morally pure and useful, that which is complete and lacking in nothing. It's all from God. James's point is only good gifts come from God. And every good gift comes from God. Don't believe your sinful desire that there is something good for you outside of God. God's gifts are always perfectly suited to meet our needs. They're always perfect. And they flow to us. Notice how he says coming down. The picture is of a cascading fountain God's blessings and good gifts flow to us, never ending. It's it's like a fountain of goodness. Don't believe the lie. God keeps back nothing. He shares all of his good gifts with us. Once we acknowledge that everything we need, everything that's good comes from the hand of God, then what should be the natural response? Gratitude, contentedness. That's the antithesis of sinful desire. This is another actionable point. It's been shared with me, and I've found it to be true, that the way to deal with unfulfilled or sinful desire is to turn around from whatever it is you're uh, desiring and thank God for what he has given you in that area of your life. Turn around and praise God for his goodness. And give him thanks because gratefulness and contentedness are the opposite of desire. I've heard it said this way. Think about what you do have rather than what you don't have. God has given each one of us so much good. Sometimes that's hard to remember in the middle of temptation. I was reminded of an old song this week while I was studying. Count your blessings. (laughs) Does anyone know that song? I love that song. It's a little dated and has a fairly simple and repetitive melody, but it's still a wonderful song. 
Here are a few words from it. When upon life's billows you're, you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Don't question God's goodness. Instead, overcome sinful desire, become a genuinely grateful person. Don't buy the deception about God's goodness. Another de deception to be on the lookout against is anything false about God's greatness. Verse 17, notice he call, he's called the father of lights. That's a great name for God. That was an ancient Jewish way of referring to God as the creator. He is the father of all lights. Why does James choose that title? Because it fits his illustration. He is the father of lights, but with him there is no variation and no shifting shadow. Think about this with me. In our solar system, all the planets revolve around the sun. And the planets themselves spin. So on earth, why is our day 24 hours? Because that's the time it takes for our earth to make one revolution, to spin one time. So what happens when our earth spins? From our point of view, the sun's position in the sky changes for us. Does the sun's position actually change? No, only our relation to it. This turning on our part creates shifting shadows and variation. So in one sense, God is very much like our sun. But in another sense, he is much, much greater and much more stable. He doesn't change because he is the father of all lights. He is unmovable, unchangeable, immutable. He is always showering good and perfect gifts. That's part of his nature. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, For I the Lord do not change. There are no days when he stops giving spiritual gifts. There are no days when he stops giving spiritual light. The flow of good things from God never varies and never stops. The fishermen here today can attest to this. A fat fish takes no bait. Think about that. If you are constantly receiving God's good and perfect gifts, why in the world would you want that baited hook? Fill up on the divine gifts. In a few minutes, we're going to close with another old hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Listen to these words. Think on these words. This is why we still sing, sing so many of those great old songs. Listen. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. The streams of mercy never cease. Nothing can eclipse God's goodness, and nothing can stop his benevolence. Nothing can interrupt the flow of his heavenly light. Don't take the devil's bait. Don't allow temptation and desire to conceive, giving birth to sin and death. God, the creator of the universe, gives all good and only good all the time. James unmasks the deception about God, about his goodness and about his greatness, about his immutability or his un unchangeableness. And finally, his plan. His plan. Look with me at verse 18. Out of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God always gives good gifts, but his best gift, his greatest gift, is a new heart. Notice, notice what he says here, of his own will. God, by the exercise of his great will, brought us forth. Think back and bring with you everything that Pastor Eric taught us on the doctrine of election. This is a deep and sometimes difficult, but ultimately wonderful doctrine to consider. Think about this. God chose 
to give us new life through the word of truth. He chose, unprompted by anything in us, unprompted by our goodness, unprompted even because of our badness. He chose to bring us forth, to give us birth, to give us life. How does he give us this life? Through the word of his truth. That's why the Bible is so important because the Bible is the means that you and I and anyone come to salvation. The Bible is the means whereby God, through his spirit, brings to completion the work of regeneration of the new birth described by Jesus when he was talking to Nicodemus. He chose to give us birth through the word of his truth. Why? So that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The first fruits are an Old Testament picture. The first fruits of the harvest in the Old Testament belonged completely to God. The first fruits of the harvest were set apart in their entirety for God and were a sign of God's promise to bring the rest of the harvest to fulfillment. Remember this, our sinful desires bring death, but God brings life. God doesn't tempt us to do evil. He recreates us to do good and become his first fruits, his beloved possession. We, as the first fruits, are set apart to God. That means we are to be holy and a representation of what is to come. To show the world what it looks like to live under the reign of our perfect sovereign king. When we surrender our will to him, we are a representation of heaven here on earth. When we surrender our thinking, our morals, our finances, our family relationships, and even our private thoughts, we're showing the world what heaven will be like. Our lives should be a picture of what's coming in the new heavens and the new earth. Don't be deceived. Don't believe the lie that God's char- uh, about God's character. God will finish what he started. To wrap this up, I would like you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. It'll be good for you to be able to see these words. We're going to be reading verses 8 to 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, We make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So, if we say we have no sin, or we have not sinned, what is this? This is our effort to justify ourselves. Sure, we can say we don't have sin, or we haven't sinned, but when we do that, what are we doing? We're deceiving ourselves. We're calling God a liar. Is God a liar? No, God only speaks truth. God only gives us good and perfect gifts, like the gift of his faithfulness to forgive sin. When we come to him with a repentant heart, there is no question as to whether or not God will forgive when we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we don't come to him in faith like this, then the truth is not in us. His word, the word of life, is not in us. Don't believe that li- the lie that following our desire outside of God's will leads to life and happiness. Believe the truth that God withholds nothing good from his children. In his perfect time, in his perfect way, he will provide everything we need for an abundant and joy-filled life. Here are my final questions. Do you believe this? Is your life evidence of this truth? Are you a glimpse of heaven here on earth? If you can answer yes, even in a small way, praise the Lord for his goodness. But if your answer is no, 
and you're always losing the battle to temptation. Think about what James has taught us here today. The first step, stop blaming God or anything else. The second step, take full responsibility for your own personal sinful desire. The third step, confess and repent for those sinful desires. And the fourth and final step, refocus on God's character as revealed through his word and thank him for his goodness and provision in your life. Think back with me about my dog, Oscar. <laughs> as cool as he was, until his will was submitted to mine, he was and would have continued to be a horrible dog. What made him one of the greatest dogs I have ever had was his willingness to trust me. Even when temptation was all around him, when you feel your desire rising, turn to God. Turn to his word and trust him to give you everything you need in his perfect way and in his perfect timing. Let's pray. Father God,